Hi everyone, Jamie Korup here. I'm your Ward 3 City Councilor here in the City of St. John's. It's my pleasure to be here today. We have a summer session, virtual session. It's going to be kicking off our St. John Celebrates events. And we have planting in the vegetable garden in the spring. I'm joined here by Tim Walsh. He's the Mon Botanical Gardens Nursery Manager. And this is all part of, said, of our series. But before we start, I do want to thank our partners. We have four. We have the City of St. John's. We have Food First NL, St. John's Food Policy Council, and of course, the Mon Botanical Gardens. How this is going to work, it's going to be about a 45-minute session. This is pre-recorded on this beautiful sunny day here in the city, and it will be put up live. And when it's live, Tim will be on via chat, which you'll see, I believe, on the bottom. So Tim, not you, Tim, the Tim in the chat. Say hi, Tim. Type it out. Perfect. All right. So again, we have Tim Walsh here. I'm going to throw it to you here, Tim. What are we doing here today? Tell me all about it. Yeah, so uh, it's a perfect time of year. So we're standing, as you said, in the beautiful botanical garden, and all behind our cameraman is incredible displays. Uh, but today our focus is here in the vegetable garden. Um, it's all about food. Uh, we really uh, think food is important. We really think that it's important that people actually grow their own food. Um, you may not necessarily produce um, enough food to get you through the winter, but I can guarantee you that any time you grow any kind of food, no matter what your success level is, it's going to make you feel good. And so this is what it's all about. It's about doing it. If you haven't done it before, give it a try. Um, if you've done it before and had limited success, it's only because you're new, so keep going. Um, every year you get better. Uh, every year you get better produce, and it just the, the feelings are just incredible. Uh, it's a great family activity. It's a great uh, community activity. So um, I thought what a great uh, thing to talk about for St. John's Day is because we want the people of St. John's and people everywhere, really, to, to get out in the backyard and use some of that space for growing some food. And so here we are in our vegetable garden, and the Mun Botanical Garden has been growing vegetables for, well, since its inception back in the 70s. Originally, this was actually a traditional in-ground bed where you would have those long drill raised beds that you see traditionally around the island. Um, but in the uh, late 80s, there was this kind of craze started across North America about building raised beds and the benefits of doing that. And what it basically does is it basically boxes in um, squares or rectangles of soil to grow in, and there's lots of advantages for that, and uh, we can talk a little bit about it here. I assume one of them is we are on a rock, <laughs> hard ground, so bringing in soil that's a lot looser will help for the uh, the roots to grow, take them on. Absolutely. It's so much easier to build a garden on top of existing soil as opposed to going down into that soil. Not that it can't be done, and again, going back to those traditional beds, that's how they did it. But if you look at a lot of the traditional communities with gardens, you often see uh, giant rock piles around the fields because they would have had to remove those rocks over time. Of course, they were growing food for a different reason. They were growing it to, to survive, to get through the winter. Uh, we are not, in this case, we're growing it for, uh, for a little bit of novelty for the most part. And of course, bragging rights. <laughs> of course, you want <laughs> to have the, that. the greenest lettuce. And yeah, the, of the course, biggest yeah, the biggest herbs, yeah. Uh, so, so here we have now our raised beds. So our raised beds are basically just, in this case, it's a square. Uh, there's a rectangle right here. And we tend to make ours no wider than four feet. And the reason for that is that I can reach halfway across on that side. And then if I want to get to the other side, I just walk around. So I can easily walk around this bed and reach all the plants uh, in a bed without actually having to walk on the soil. Because look at when I walk on the soil here. I'm compressing that soil. And every time I compress that soil, uh, it's making that soil tight. It doesn't allow water and moisture to move through it well. And of course, it doesn't allow the roots to move through it either. So it really negatively impacts on the ability of those plants to kind of do their thing. So I'm just going to loosen that up because I don't even like the look of that right from the start. Um, so the other thing I noticed too is, especially in 2021, the price of lumber. Yes. This doesn't look like pressure treated. I was always under the assumption use pressure treated, it'll last longer. True, it will last longer, uh, but I, but uh, our philosophy has always been, well, what is it that makes that wood last longer? Um, and certainly, um, there's, there's, there were known chemicals. It used to be arsenic in pressure-treated lumber, um, and of course, that's obviously a dangerous thing to be putting into your soil. There are other chemicals in there now that help to preserve that wood. And our thought is that, well, if you're putting soil exposed to that wood on the inside, then that wood is going to leach out whatever is in that wood and it's going to go into the soil. And just to be incredibly safe about that and to be natural about what we're eating, um, and we want to make sure that we're producing good food, that we try not to do that. So don't use pressure treated. That's about a two by six roughly. That's, uh, that's two by, uh, that's actually two by ten. Two so, by okay. so that's a good point. I'm glad you mentioned yep. that because um, we s actually make our beds out of two by ten. And 
you don't really just sit the box on top of the ground because what you really have to do is lock the sides in on the bottom. Okay. Because if you think about it, these beds are here now and we're using them, but they're also here in the middle of winter when there's no vegetables in here. And what'll happen is that freeze thaw cycles and just the natural pressure of, the, of the, all that soil in there anyways will push out those wooden sides and you'll end up with the sides bowing over time. You probably won't see as much on a four by four because it's a nice small square. But when you get these long beds right that we've got down here, this is a four by 12. That's a 12 foot long run. Um, that's locked in underneath. And actually what we do down here, what you can't see is halfway down this bed, there's actually a two by four that runs through the middle to of this bed. It up. To yeah. brace it up, to lock the sides together so that you don't end up with that, uh, that bowed side. So, uh, so that's certainly a, a good awesome. point. All right, so we got the start of how we're gonna do the flower bed. Yeah. Am I gonna need gloves? That's my next question. You know, it's not a bad idea. All right, you know? hit me. Look at that. Still got it. <laughs> All right, I'll put some gloves on here. All right, yeah, let's get ourselves ready here. So uh, this soil, uh, I will say, you know, we are a botanical garden. We've been working this soil for years. It's, it's pretty beautiful soil. But um, what you have to remember is, uh, is every year we're demanding a lot from the soil. So if we think about the perennial beds that are behind us here, uh, those plants are in there, those plants stay in there all year long. And just where perennials are all year round? Yes. Okay. Yep, they come back year after year after gotcha. year. They go dormant in the fall and they sit there during the winter time, but in the springtime they start to grow and they, and they grow brand new shoots and stems all from that existing root system that's constantly there. A vegetable garden is different. A vegetable garden does it all in one year. And if you think about that, that's pretty intensive. You know, you have to, you have to start a plant usually for most cases from seed and then that seed has to grow and it has to produce. Whether it's uh, a broccoli head or whether it's lettuce or whether it's a, an early radish or whether it's a, a late turnip or potatoes, all of that has to happen in one season. And so that plant is gonna be looking for a really nutritious soil in order to make that happen. Um, if it doesn't have that, then it's just gonna struggle and we're gonna end up with a, with a produce that's really uh, um, not to our satisfaction. So it, it's all in the soil. You know, the, the message is to be loyal to your soil. It's incredibly important. How can we expect to get those, you know, those, those prize winning vegetables uh, or the vegetables, if they're not prize winning, at least just to brag to your neighbors, uh, if we don't augment the soil in the first place. So is there a certain soil you should be getting? at your local garden center? Can you use just regular screen topsoil? And then is there any nutrients you should be putting at the start before we, now we got the, like I said, we got the box. We do. Now the soil. Yep. So the box here has been filled with soil. We started out with some good topsoil and then we, we augmented that with compost. Okay. And so we've been doing that year after year. So every year in this vegetable garden, we add a top layer of compost and then mix it in. I'm gonna do that now. But if you're a brand new gardener, just starting out and you just build a box and you have it out sitting in your garden, uh, then you might wanna go to a local garden center and ask them for what's called a triple mix. And a triple mix is usually got topsoil and peat, and it's got some grit in it for drainage, and it would also have some compost or something like that. So the different companies have different recipes, but basically what you're getting is you're getting that mineral topsoil base and that organic base that comes from the, uh, the compost or the peat and that's gonna have that nice balance. But my experience is that you still need, for vegetables, you still need to add some extra compost. And so we have compost here at the Botanical Garden. We have quite a bit of it because we do it all naturally here at the Botanical Garden. Everything that comes off of our vegetable garden, off of our flower garden, you can imagine how much it is, it all goes into a compost pile. Everything is composted here at the garden and we shred it if we need to uh, and we let it sit on the compost pile and then we screen it and we put it on the beds. Sometimes you don't have to screen it like this compost right here. So this is actually compost that was made. Uh, this is actually a little bit special because this was actually made from kitchen scraps from the dining hall at Memorial University okay. at the campus. Uh, and so this is all the fruit and vegetables that come out of the kitchen. So it's wonderful stuff. A lot of food gone into there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds that have been diverted from the landfill to this compost and pile. city does something different with our leaves, the leaf side collection. So yes. the separate truck picks it up, it's brought to the landfill, it'll decompose, and then that's what we use for composting our city parks and fields. So, yep. and again, it's all, a lot of it is about diversion. From Absolutely, yep. And actually I've got a bucket of leaf mold here too, because we also compost our leaves separately. And you can see there's subtle differences difference, between yeah. the two. It's a little bit darker, um, incredibly nutritious stuff, 100% decomposed uh, leaves from, des from deciduous trees. So both, uh, both incredibly nutritious materials. Doesn't really matter which one you have, as long as you've got something organic to put on there. 
So let's put on this compost. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have to walk on here just a little bit because this bucket's a bit heavy. I'm just gonna spread this around on the surface of that soil. And you can even see some familiar things in there like little bits of eggshells that are not completely decomposed yet. But that doesn't matter. That's they'll fine to stay in there. They'll finish, that, they'll finish off in the soil. Yeah. Eggshells just take a little bit longer than some of the other things. But if you look at this here, this used to be cantaloupe and it used to be lettuce and it used to be broccoli and it used to be uh, you know, cabbages and all that stuff. And now it's just this beautiful, incredible, nutritious material that we're gonna add to the soil. You keep it on top, you rake it on nope. a little bit. We're gonna, I'm gonna mix that in now. The first thing I'm gonna do, so if you're gonna garden, it's a good idea to have just a couple of basic tools, but this is probably the number one if you're gonna vegetable garden, because this is what's gonna help us mix that material into the surface. When we get down to some of the finer details, you'll probably want just a couple of hand tools. So this is a spade and a hand fork. So first thing we're gonna do is just spread that out over the surface. And I'm just gonna evenly spread it. You can see where it's nice and dark, so you can easily see where you wanna spread it if you've got any. The soil should be no, shouldn't be above the wood, it should be at Should level. be at level, yeah, yeah, you don't want it rounded. This is actually starting to get a little bit full here, but I think I'll be okay today. So before I do that, there's one other important thing that we're gonna do. So soils in Newfoundland are generally fairly acidic. And um, we talk about that all the time, about uh, adjusting the pH in the soil or making the soil more alkaline. And what that does is that it basically changes the soil chemistry so that the plants are more easily able to take up food in the soil. So when the soil is acidic, plants don't do that very easily. And so when we make it alkaline, that actually helps them to uptake those nutrients. And so, I know a lot of people are familiar with garden lawn. Yes. They say you can't over lawn your lawn here, and they say do it in spring and fall. So we're doing something similar just for the flower bed. Exactly. Okay. And lime is generally put on at a rate of about 50 pounds per thousand square feet. So that's, that's, a, that's not a lot when you think about it. We've only got a four by four square here. So not very much. I've worked out the math, and it's about a cup of lime. And so as you can see, this is not a measuring cup because it doesn't have to be perfect. This is actually pelletized lime too, which is, uh, which is kind of nice because it spreads a lot easier. So it's the same idea as the powdered lime, but the pelletized lime just helps it to disperse a little easier. It doesn't get airborne. In, in Newfoundland, it's pretty windy. The powder windy. stuff's not, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just gonna evenly spread this out. There we have it. And that's it, we're just about ready. So now all I'm gonna do, is I'm just gonna dig that in. So- You wanna move it around. So yeah, so I'm yep. not gonna get on the bed anymore now. I'm gonna keep my foot out here or wherever it's more comfortable. Watch your back when you're doing this, you know, make sure you got a nice bend. That's the beauty of these raised beds is that the bed is up a little bit higher. So you don't actually yep. have to, if I was doing this on the ground, you can kind of see how much further I have to get down. And now all of a sudden I'm up here, you can see the angle of my, my back bend here has, has changed completely. I've seen some, uh, especially some of our senior citizens, I've seen some of the beds they've had, and they've been on, especially for this, they've been on four by four posts. Yes. So they've been cemented around blocks in the ground, even patio blocks. Yep. You wanna make sure it's secure, but I, you know, I, I assume for that reason, so you're not bending over. Absolutely, there are some actually uh, really well adapted vegetable gardens where you can actually get a chair underneath them. So if somebody has mobility concerns, okay. that they can actually just get the chair underneath. So the bed is actually at just above knee level and you can just reach in over the bed and do, uh, do that work. Sometimes you do get a little bit of non-compostables in there like this little butter container. So take that out. But for the most part, this compost is really clean. And I'm trying to just right, make, you see, see what I'm doing now. Done this can do it. Put, put yeah, I mean, put yes, I'll do this out. I'll do this end. You got to do that end over there. So what you can see what I'm doing, Jamie, is I'm I'm actually turning it, turning. and then I'm if I'm just hitting it with the back of my fork. Okay. And that just helps to break it up. And when we're all done, we're just going to go over it nicely and kind of level it off. So all right, let's give it try. a go. I'm, I'm decent with a broom, so no one do any hurry hard jokes, please. <laughs> and try to keep the soil in here, right? Yeah. There you go. Yep. Looking good. And so this is a great time, not that we're seeing it a whole lot here, but if you've got a garden at home, it's a really great time to pick through the soil if you, anything comes through the surface, any large rocks come to the surface, any tree roots, anything like that. Yeah, there you go, knock that down. And what you're doing there is actually really important. In fact, give it a really good smack. Oh yeah? Yeah, really good. Because what we're trying to avoid here is the soil settling after we've planted. 
So what Jamie's doing when he's hitting that soil down, Much he's removing bigger. all those air spaces that we just created by digging it over. And, and then when we plant and water, the soil's not gonna slump. Good job. All right. Yeah, so you really, you can actually really give it a good smack. I always think it's a really good opportunity to get, get out some of your frustrations. Yeah. So if there's anything that's bothering you, they say gardening is a gentle sport, but that's not for sure. Well, so when my wife wonders why I'm in the backyard with a shovel beating my uh, <laughs> house, I can, I can say Tim told me. I told you, yes, that's right. All right. So now we're just gonna use the back of the fork here and we're going to level it off. I like to clean off the edges. I don't like soil falling onto the pathways because on the pathways, then you get weeds uh, starting to grow in that soil. So we'll try and keep that off. Yeah, any little bits that you might see there that are not and so organic. This is small, anything in these weeds. Any of those weeds? Out, right? Yep, get those out now because they're gonna take advantage of this good soil too. So we've got a beautiful little bed here now. All right. Look at that, all ready to plant. Now what? So I've got some seeds and I've got some plants. Bring us over that tray right. of plants there. I just laid on the bed there. This is there for you. So there's lots of different ways that we can plant, but we're gonna focus on this time of year on, on basically the one plant, but we're gonna do it in two different ways. This looks like lettuce. That is lettuce. I have it every night for supper. It's By choice, I swear. <laughs> that is definitely lettuce. What kind of lettuce? It looks there's different colors. There's, there's different varieties for sure. So there's, I'll show you what they are. This is the one called Black Seeded Simpson, which is this incredible little uh, crinkly leaf variety. Um, sort of a pale green color, but don't let the color um, alarm you because it's not that it's it's actually deficient in anything that's its natural hybrid color grows incredibly well for us um, this is a variety called barilla which is a little bit more upright you can kind of see the differences there and then we've got this lovely uh, red called red coral and uh, again it's there's there's little bits of differences in flavor in lettuce. I mean, lettuce by itself is not generally, yep. you know, a huge flavorful plant, but it does have certain qualities within the different varieties. And some of them have a nice crunch, that sort of thing. And, and some of them hold up better for salads and some of them do better in wraps. So there are quite a variety in lettuce. Um, the one big difference here, of course, is this nice red color. And that's just incredible on the plate. So it's yep. a really beautiful lettuce to actually have on your dinner table. So. Uh, so look for different varieties of lettuce uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about growing your plants. And so you might wanna think about going out to a garden center and just purchasing a cell pack of lettuce. You know, this will cost you a few bucks, not that much, probably maybe five or $6. And here we've got 12 little lettuce plants right ready to go. Certainly with our growing season being short here, getting a kickstart behind this first is coming from seed because I did do seed last year. Yeah. Uh, my sister Jill bought some stuff for myself and my daughter and we did have a little, I think it was called Little Growers. Right. Little, we had it in the house and we put it outside and it was nice. And you know, we had lettuce, enough for some garnish. Sure. Because yeah. you know, it was a small, it wasn't, you know, it's a, a tenth of the size of this. So yeah. this will kickstart you. So you've got something Absolutely. when it comes time for harvest. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's a good point. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna sow some seed and while that seed is germinating, uh, well, we're gonna sow seed and we're also gonna grow, so plant these plants. While the seed is gonna take a lot more time to germinate, these will already be off to the races and we'll be eating these just as these are starting to come up. By the time these are all eaten, then these are up and ready to go. So Instead of having a whole pile of lettuce to eat in two weeks, yeah. spaced out over. Yeah, gotcha. spaced it out, yeah. Sound like you know what you're talking about, Tim. I've done this a few times, right. yes, yeah. So, uh, so now we're planting. So now it's ju just about, well, what, I, we're gonna do lettuce, but what do you wanna do? Like, what do you wanna do? Um, it's, it's all about thinking about, well, first of all, what can you grow? What's your light conditions like? Where are you putting this thing? Where is it, where's your vegetable garden gonna go? Ours is in an ideal spot. We're in a little bit of shade now, you're in the sun, uh, in just a few minutes and it's just uh, not even 10 in the morning here now. Uh, this whole bed is gonna be in full sun and it's gonna be in full sun for the whole day. Yeah. That's not the case for everybody. Not everybody has that, but they still wanna grow vegetables. So look for the brightest spot that you have, basically. Um, five hours direct sun will be great. Full sun all day, it's the best. Better. So somewhere in between there, I think you'll, you'll end up with, uh, with a good result. So the main thing you want is sun. Then Absolutely. obviously water is a big part oh, yeah, of anything. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to the water yeah. when it's time, but you know, hopefully you've, you're, you're by a, a water source and you'll, you'll 
be water, giving these plants the water as they need it. Uh, but in terms of location, that's what you really want to think about. Uh, and then think about what is it that you'd like to grow? Are you, do you not like lettuce? Would you rather grow beans? Would you uh, rather have a bed of strawberries? You know, the sky's the limit. But when you've only got a small bed like this, there is a limit to what you can grow. You know, we're, we can put a lot of lettuce in here, but we can only fit probably two squash plants in here because squash plants are really big and they're a vining plant and they'll take over this whole bed. We may only be able to fit probably six cabbages in here. So you better like cabbage if that's what you're gonna grow because that's all you're gonna be able to fit in one of these beds. It's a good question, a good point, Tim, because I know a lot of people say in Newfoundland, you can only grow root vegetables here. Oh, that's not the case. Exactly. Yeah. So to that point, there's a number of different things you can grow here. Yep. Some might take a little more work, obviously. But yeah, absolutely. Oh, my goodness, yes. Yes, so you can grow quite a lot of vegetables uh, here in, in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. If you, uh, if you were to be able to pan our, our area here, we've got about maybe uh, 10 or 12 different boxes here. Uh, but we've got things like garlic, we've got kale, we've got beans. Uh, we've got onions where we're going to put in some cabbage soon, radishes and beet uh, and peas and tomatoes. The potatoes are already planted. Uh, they're just about to poke through the ground. So there's so many things that you can actually grow uh, here in, in our climate. So with our lettuce, uh, we talked about growing some seeds. So let's look at that. So when, you th when it comes to growing this bed, the, the, this is um, a really nice way to kind of grow plants, vegetables in a very organized way. We've got a square. And so we can actually grid this out. And so there's a really great concept called square foot gardening. Uh, this uh, author by the name of Mel Bartholomew uh, wrote a book back in the 80s. And he talked about basically that, just making a grid on your vegetable garden and maximizing what you can get out of a season in your vegetable garden. And so I've got a stick here. So I could easily just, and, and if, you're, if you're a stickler for detail, you could, actually, you could actually get out a measuring tape and do uh, 12 inches by 12 inches. I'm not. I'm just going to, with my stick, just going to do that. And I'm going to probably do that again. And maybe one more time. So now you know what you're working with there. So now I know what I got, yeah. yeah. We talked about the gardens too, for people that want to do it at home. Uh, you know, at the City of St. John's, we also have community gardens. And yes. you know, my ward, for argument's sake, up at the church, and Cowan Heights has one. Uh, Eric Street has one in Ward 2, and they're all over the city. And you can find those on the City of St. John's website. Also, if you want to start one. You know, we can connect you with staff. There's information on our site. So you don't have to go through whether it's a uh, feasibility barrier for you or whatnot. There is community gardens. They have it there. You bring your soil, bring your plant seeds. And I know my daughter did with her friend, and uh, they had quite the harvest at the end of it. Those are great. Uh, yeah. I really applaud the city for that. Um, I'm also a member, my family has a, a plot at the Jim McSheffrey Garden on Mount Sire Road. And um, just the, that, that space is just amazing. It's, it's there. Uh, available for people to use and um, and you just have this wonderful space to go and grow food with your family. So That's fantastic. Great. Water's yeah. provided. You just basically just uh, bring your bring your gloves and bring what you want to grow. Yeah. So this is our bid. I've gridded it out. Um, we can actually look at this now and say, well, how much do I want to grow of what? Um, I kind of like to, uh, I like to decorate my vegetable garden too. There's a little bit of that. Uh, I like to kind of play around with, with how we would uh, maybe um, organize the planting. So if we look at you know, the greens versus the reds and the different types, kind of play around with it that way. So let's start, um, if this was gonna be a variety of different vegetables, I'm not gonna fill this with, with lettuce because that's way too much lettuce, but look how easy it is now, Jamie, because we've mixed up the soil. We actually don't even need a gardening tool. We can just use our hand and I'm just gonna open up the soil a little bit, put that plant in there and bring the soil around and I'm firming it in with my fingers because I do really want good contact with that, with the soil and the roots. I planted a cedar tree yesterday and it fell over last night the <laughs> because it wasn't that down enough, so I hear you. Do you want to try one? Sure. Put one right here in this corner maybe. In this corner here? Yeah, sure. All right, so I'm just digging it out a bit. Yeah, I really put, it, put it in the so corner, of the, put it in the center of the square that center I made. Square. When I'm taking these out, yes. you can take it right from the bottom. So lift up the tray and so kind of push up, they're a little soft. So push up on Just the bottom. Push up here. a little bit, and there you go. Now okay. grab the grab the root by the bottom. To very gently cover those seeds. We don't want to bury those little seeds too far because if we do, of course, they won't have we don't have the energy to be able to push up through that soil soil when they germinate. And then just with with my hand, I'm just patting it down to make. Don't uh, use the pitchfork now. No, pitch that's right. Done. The pitchfork. So okay. I'm just going to lay that right there just for now. Because the other thing that we want to do is we want to label it. Um, we want to make sure that we know what this is in a few weeks time when it starts to pop up. And so this is actually 
red salad bowl, which is another nice red variety. So I'm just going to say on my label here, lettuce red salad bowl. And I'm going to put the day's date on there because that's going to be something for me to learn from from next year. So I'll look at this and I'll say I sowed this lettuce seed last year on June the 15th and it germinated well and by you know July the 15th I was eating lettuce and that kind of tells me that it'll take about a month or so a month or maybe six weeks before from seed to uh, to to, uh, to harvest. So it'd be good to almost have a log book or an Excel spreadsheet exactly. to keep track of it over the years so you know. Exactly yeah. And Tim the other thing too a lot of people like iceberg and romaine are the two I guess staples of lettuce for yep. most people stable but I mean, you don't have any of that here, so there's a different varieties that can grow. And oh my goodness, know. yes, yeah, yeah. And iceberg works well. Romaine also, they all grow well here. Um, just find the one that you like best, right? And give that a try. Um, you know, once the the one thing about lettuce is that it is a warm, uh, warm temperature crop. So it's kind of something that we really have to make sure that we're really past that cool cold period, and we're certainly past the danger of frost. Here at the botanical garden. Our transplanting date for tender things, like lettuce transplants, like all the annuals that we use in our flower beds, um, is the 15th of June. We don't put anything out until the 15th okay. of June. We've known that from our records in the past that any time earlier than that, you do risk getting those plants damaged from cold, from late, late cold weather, uh, even a frost. I mean, it was the the 6th of June here in St. John's, and we had a major frost warning, actually right across from Providence. I had to take all our plants we bought and put them in the ground. Yeah, yeah. So, and so if for some reason June 17th, a day yep. after June 15th, yep. I've seen people come over and just put pots over the top of them, yes. which will help. So is that something you would recommend doing if we did have a freak? Absolutely, late June, absolutely. I mean, I, I, we are here are more inclined to just wait and not put it out. But of course, we do have you know greenhouses that we can keep some plants in and protect them. So for the homeowner uh, or the home grower, it's important to, to know that you don't have that option. So if you're going to be starting these plants like indoors in your basement under lights or on your window ledge, it's all about timing. If you do that too early, and I see it all the time, unfortunately, uh, because we get we had a really nice spell of weather back in April, and people got very excited in the local anxious. gardening they community. Get, they yeah. want to get their things that got Yeah, there. and I'm yeah. anxious too, and we all are, because you know winters are long here, and we're desperate to kind of see some new growth. Uh, try and hold off on that. Try and try and really, you know, bite your bite your tongue and don't let that happen. June fifteenth. We'll yeah, that's June, fif June fifteenth is the planting day. But work backwards from that to the dates that you logically and realistically can start something in your home, in your basement, on your window ledge, and you'll be able to bring that plant in a healthy state so that when it's near the 15th of June and you're planting it out, that it's in good shape. What happens is if you start it too early, uh, the plants get incredibly leggy because the light levels are low inside the house and the plants are reaching for light and you end up with this incredibly spindly plant that's right up here that's really weak not able to stand up on its own because it's it's been growing in that condition for too long take it out so the wind and then yeah it's toast. yeah so think about timing think about what works best for you but i mean just like we're we're talking about here about trying things try things and and if that happened to you this year then think about that next year. You know, make a note of that. And make sure that next year, when you're about to do that, okay, I'm not going to start it that early. That's why good records are a good idea, Excellent. because you learn from them. So we've got uh, some lettuce in here now uh, from seed. So this is my. I'm going to take that off now. I know that that row uh, is lettuce. If you were a little bit concerned about whether you're going to remember that, you could put another label in here so that between those two labels are lettuce, or you can pull a string and just staple a string onto here and pull it tight. Okay. Anything like that that kind of marks it, because right now there's nothing there, and there's not going to be anything there for a while. And so just to risk not uh, disturbing that, let's make sure that we mark it somehow. If you had a little stick like this, you could just leave it just to the side of it, just right there. Now I know that just right next to that, there's a row of lettuce. About there's a row of lettuce. And so now, as you can see, we've got other room here for planting different things. You know, in my tray here, um, I've got, I've got some, uh, some. Oh yeah, here we go. I've got some. I got some Swiss chard, and this is a variety called Rainbow. And if you see Jamie, there's yellow stems and there's red stems. There's even some in there that are white stems. And Swiss chard is incredibly nutritious stuff. What is it? I'm going to ask the. And this isn't playing um, silly here. No idea what that is. Oh yeah, no. So it's an it's an edible uh, green. It's uh, it's in the cabbage family. Oh, okay, so uh, it's cabbage. Yeah, and it's a, it, but it doesn't produce a head like cabbage. It just produces these upright leaves, 
And so these leaves become very large, and uh, and you just basically harvest the leaves and put them uh, in the oil. So you okay. you'll cook them. You'll cook them sort of like spinach on the on the uh, uh, on a pan. You'll just wilt them, and uh, incredibly delicious, incredibly nutritious. And so we could look at again because in this case we have different color stems, like the like the golden stem of this variety, and then there's a red one here. We can play around with design and layout here. You don't have to, uh, but it's fun too. Uh, but you really don't have to because, as I always say, the plants don't care. The <laughs> plants don't care what if they're in straight lines. Yeah. You know, we don't have to do it this way. We could just d disperse the plants however we like, as long as they have room to grow, as long as they've got good s space uh, um, in, in between each other, as long as they've got good nutritious soil, and as long as they've got the sun to drive it, and we're going to give them water throughout the season, uh, then we're off to the races. And it's a rule of them, too as long as you've got room, any garden center that you buy here that has stuff started, if they're selling it here, you can pretty much grow it here. Yes. That's yeah. an assumption, okay. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move over to this bed and have a look. All right. So um, this bed is already lined out with these cages, and these are actually for tomatoes. So we are going to eventually have a row of tomatoes down through the middle of this bed here. Um, and these are actually called tomato cages, and they're designed to support the tomato as it grows. So this tomato is gonna be planted here, we're gonna put the cage around it, and then it's gonna be held inside of that cage. You can see the tomato is already getting a little bit tall um, because they, they actually need that support. So what's the blue thing you have around that's Oh, that, that's just the support. That's a tag that we use here so at the So that's just for now until you put it in your- uh, Exactly. Tomato, yeah. what's this called again? Uh, tomato, tomato cage. Tomato yeah. cage. So I've got a couple of different examples here. So, so let's get that tomato into the ground first and we'll talk about how to support it and what tomatoes need. So again, we've got that beautiful soil. This soil bed has already been fixed up here and this is where my tomato is gonna go. I'm actually gonna get my fork again. Now, a lot of people grow tomatoes in greenhouses, but you don't have to have a greenhouse to grow tomatoes. No, uh, it's good to get them started off uh, in a warm space, and, but there are definitely varieties of tomatoes that grow better outdoors than others. So when you go to your garden center, look for varieties that are grown for that. There's lots of northern hardier varieties of tomatoes that are much better than, uh, than some of the others that, um, that are more suited to green. So basically, when, when you're starting this, whatever you're putting in there is ask questions. Go to your garden center. Oh my center. goodness, yes. And I'm, I'm sure if someone was working at a garden center, they're passionate about it. They're only more than happy to help you. Absolutely. Well, that's what that's what they want to do because they want they want their they customers. Want, they want you to come back next year. Yeah, they want your customers to go away with knowledge. They want you to exactly. they want you to be they want your customers to be successful, of course. And so I've dug a quite a deep hole for this plant. If you can see there, I'm actually down underneath, and that's that's the cool thing about tomatoes. So tomatoes actually have the ability to root uh, along the stem. Okay. And so that does a couple of things. Number one, it creates a nice uh, big root system, and it also stabilizes this plant when I put it in the ground. Because right now, when I take this plant out, as you can see, it's a beautiful root, say. Yeah. I'm gonna turn it upside down just so we can see how well those roots okay. have developed. Yeah. And you can even see the shape of the pot in the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, amazing, amazing plant. This is actually a cool plant. This is a, this is a plant called Patio Choice Yellow. And it's actually designed, it's a hybrid that's designed for growing outdoors and growing in containers on your patio. Okay. Um, or in a, in a vegetable garden, it doesn't have to be patio, obviously. And it produces fruit that are mid-size and the fruit are actually yellow instead of the classic orangey red tomato. Um, and so I've already got a little support uh, stem in there right now. I'm gonna take that out in a minute and put in a larger one. Um, but I'm just gonna remove the label for now. And I am gonna bury it uh, like I said, I'm going to actually bury it down to probably about here. And there's a couple of leaves that are under that, uh, that line, so I'm just going to remove them. They that doesn't hurt the plant. Not at all. That pinches off so easily. And then we're just going to sit that right in the middle of the bed there and just simply bring the soil around it, just like that. Firm it in place so that the plant is nice and firm. It's got good contact with the soil, and you can see now it's already fairly sturdy. But what's going to happen is that this plant is going to continue to grow. In fact, this plant is going to grow even probably li a little bit above those tomato cages. And you can buy these plants this size right from the garden store? Yeah, this one's probably a little bit bigger than you might get at the garden center. Sometimes they're even smaller. Sometimes okay. you get them in cell packs like we just took our lettuces out of. It depends on the time of year that you buy them. Um, sometimes they'll be this size, maybe a little bit shorter than that. 
Um, and again, it could be that somebody started them themselves uh, indoors in their, in their window ledge. So if the danger of frost has passed and uh, the cool temperatures have passed, the cold temperatures have passed, we're getting good nighttime temperatures because that's the biggest concern this time of year. It's not so much the daytime temperatures, the nighttime temperatures can drop down. And if you take a plant that's been in a greenhouse and just put it outdoors overnight and it goes down to like two or three degrees, then that's almost toast for these plants. Yesterday was 30 here, today's around yeah. 18, and tomorrow's supposed to be six or seven. Yeah. So as long as it doesn't freeze, you're fine. Well, for tomatoes, it needs to be a little better than that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so the thing about anything that's been growing indoors too, we have to actually harden it off. You actually have to acclimatize it to the outdoor temperatures. So you can't just take a plant that's been growing in a greenhouse in 20 degrees, bring it outdoors and sit it in the, in the garden. That plant uh, will be shocked, no matter what kind of plant it is, even if it's a hardy perennial. If it's been grown in a, in a warm greenhouse and then it's just like that, instantly exposed to a cold environment, then the it's tissue in this plant is, is not what's called hardened off. Uh, it's not basically gotten used to those temperatures. So the plants uh, in the nursery, the nursery growers would have hardened those off by slowly reducing the temperatures in the greenhouse by allowing, by rolling up the sides or opening up the doors in the greenhouse, letting some of that cool air okay. come inside and it acclimatizes the plants. And then sometimes even they'll move some plants outdoors on a warm day and then take them back in um, in, a, in the evening time. And that's what homeowners do when they have plants, smaller numbers of plants on window ledges. So you bring it out, bring your tray of plants out, sit it on the back deck, front deck, wherever the nice sun is during the daytime. And then in the evening time, just after supper, bring it back in. And you do that for three, four, or five days, depending on what you have and what the temperatures are. And at that point, then the plants are ready to stay out. Okay. Assuming the weather is continuing to, Getting to get warm. Friend of mine's dad, Bob and Bay Roberts, he used to leave his greenhouse door open, so he was toughening them up. Yeah. I didn't understand it 20 yeah. years ago, but now, yeah. since then, my wife and I, with the plants we've had, yeah, we'll put them outside for yeah. the, this is like jumping in a cold pool. You don't want to do exactly. that, you want to ease in. You want to ease in, yeah. Yeah, we don't want any polar bear dips in the garden. <laughs> so uh, this is our label. I'm going to stick that in there just to make sure that we know the plants. We could have four or five different varieties. The beauty of tomatoes is that there's just so many varieties. And so uh, this, is a, this is a yellow variety. We actually have a variety over there called Midnight Snack, and the fruit are actually black. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, and they're, when they're ripe, they're actually black. And they're just as tasty and just as sweet. But, you know, uh, talk about an interesting thing to have on your plate. I don't know, know if I could eat it. A black tomato. <laughs> oh, you would. When you just eat, it's like the Lay's chips. I bet you can't just eat one. Um, it, it's amazing. So, so this is our tomato. We've got it in here. Uh, we could simply, I'm going to show a couple of things we can do. So this is our cage here. And uh, they come in different sizes, depending on the, the, the plants that you're growing. And they've got, in this case, they've got three wire uh, sticks at the bottom. And we'll just bring it carefully down over the plant, being careful not to break any branches, and push it into the soil. It goes into the soil so easily because the soil is so nice and loose. And there's our, there's our cage. We don't have to do anything with that. I, I Put it down far enough so it, it doesn't tip over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so what'll happen is the plant will grow up. And yes, it might lean left or right, but it's just going to hit it's the cage catch. along the way. Um, if you don't have those, um, what you can do is just put a stick in next to it. And so we could use this stick that we used for the lettuce and just drive that into the ground next to it and just tie the plants on as it grows. So what's going to happen is this plant is going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And you have to support that. If you don't support that, that plant's going to fall over, especially in our climate, and the, and the stems are going to crack and we won't get a good harvest in that. So the other thing I did which is kind of fun. I actually got this stick bamboo. It's a big piece of bamboo. It doesn't have to be bamboo. In fact, it'd be much better if you, if you just used some local piece of wood that you have or, or a, a rinded out stick, not pressure treated. But we just have a lot of this material around here at the Botanical Garden. I've actually pre-tied strings around here. And so I'm just gonna drive that into the ground. And that's just garden, regular garden. That's just regular garden twine. Yeah. And then what we can do then as the plant grows up is just, with these pieces of string that I've got already here, just bring them around and tie them to the stake. But then and those blue things, the I guess the plastic or whatnot, that comes off. Yes. So it doesn't. Yes, doesn't we'll 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 Once take that off. Yeah. Th this is just a little uh, a little stapled on piece of plastic that there it just comes off very easily. Yeah, because what you don't want is what's called girdling which is basically when there's something attached to the stem that's too tight too restricted. and the plant starts to grow and it starts to continue to grow, uh, but it can't grow around that string and it does restrict growth. And in fact, it creates a really weak point 
and oftentimes the plant will crack off as a result of that. So then as this plant grows up to the next piece of string, tie we'll tie on. that on and so on and so forth. It looks like you haven't tied it too tight. You left about an inch or so. You yep. want to give it that ability to hold up but have yep. able to grow. I also want it to get, it, get build its own strength too. So giving it that ability to move around a little bit will actually strengthen the stem. It'll actually strengthen the root system. It'll help to anchor the plant in place. So we've got that in there. Last thing, of course, we want to do before we do anything else, and we would do this with the lettuce as well as to give it some water. It's also a really good time to give it some fertilizer. So we've already given all these beds some great fertilizer by adding that organic matter. Um, we can also add fertilizer to our watering can in the form of a water soluble fertilizer. And so there's lots of great products out there. Just look for the one that you like to use best. Um, generally, people tend to err towards organic fertilizers when it comes to growing food. And I think there's a logic in that because we basically want the healthiest product in the end. We want to make sure that whatever goes into this soil is nice and rich and organic and as natural as possible. So look for organic fertilizers. There's lots and there's even the num several companies in Newfoundland that are producing uh, fertilizers from kelp and from fish offal and uh, various other different natural ingredients. And so mix it at the recommended rate uh, in your watering can and then give it a really good drink. So as soon as you plant it, that's very important. As soon as you plant it and it's in the water, it's pretty well right away. Yeah, water it, water it in right away. And I guess depending on the plants, it's the same as the distance to plant it. I assume there'll be some how much you should water it. Does it tell you that? Uh, no, you it won't, but it'll, but, uh, but with a lot of vegetables, with all vegetables, they just don't like to dry out. So and you in can't fact, overwater it really. You can't over, okay. you, well, you could overwater it if you're out there every morning with the hose hosing it yep. down when, and then we're having rain at night and there's really no need sort of thing. But just when the surface of the soil looks like it's starting to dry, then you might want to think about going Put some water. Some water. Okay. Yeah. And so we're giving that a good water. What we, you, you saw the root system that I put in there and how, and I even put it down even a bit deeper. So that's down in the ground of this much. I want to make sure that I'm not just putting water on the surface here now. I want to make sure that I'm putting enough water on there that it's making its way down through the surface of the soil, down into that root system and enveloping that root system to make sure that we've got a really nicely watered in plant. That fertilizer that's in the water is also making its way down there. And so not only is it going to start taking up that moisture, it's going to start getting the benefits of that food as well. And so you put water in here and then put the organic uh, fertilizer. It's already in plant there. Plant steroids, as uh, my wife yeah. calls it, <laughs> down into here and yeah. gotcha. It's already in there. Yeah. So now when we're watering, we're fertilizing as well. And so the fertilizer that you use will have a recommended dose. It'll have a recommended uh, rate of mixture and then it'll tell you how often you need to apply that. And that's going to be based on the plants that you're growing. Um, you can simply go, if you're growing a lot of tomatoes, go to a nursery and say, I'm growing tomatoes. What's the best fertilizer for tomatoes? And they'll give you the right one and then you just use that with the instructions that come with it and you'll be uh, you'll have some good good results in the end the one thing we mentioned about water and tomatoes tomatoes actually have uh, an issue called blossom endra and it actually causes the end of the, the tomatoes to blacken and rot and it's a result of irregular watering okay so when you if you're growing containers it's not uh, potatoes sorry tomatoes it's not as big of an issue when you're growing it in a big bed like this but a lot of people do grow tomatoes in containers on their deck um, and in their backyards and front yards. And containers dry out a lot quicker because there's a limited volume of soil. And if you can imagine, as this plant grows up, when we've got a plant this size, you can really get a sense of how big that root system is too because it has to support all, this, the all these leaves. The roots you're gonna get. Yeah, and so uh, that has the uh, chance of drying out. The chance of that drying out is a lot greater than it, it is here. And when that happens, you end up sometimes with that blossom end rot. So you'll be disappointed with your tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So if you're growing tomatoes, especially in containers, just make sure that you regularly water them, that they do not ever dry out in between waterings. Okay, Tim, we have our seeds in the ground. We have our small plants, lettuce in the ground. We have our tomatoes in the ground. Now what? Now we've got the, the next weeks and months to just watch them grow. So what do we do now? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, in, that's a really important uh, uh thing to, to remind us of because we do have to watch them. You know, they're not going to just do it on their own. They'll do a lot of it on their own, but they can also be some challenges along the way if we just kind of walk away from it. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that these plants get enough water, especially in the early stages. We've put in these young little plant starts right here, these little lettuce plants. We've also done some row of seeds and in the home garden we'll have a variety of different plants in there. 
they're going to start to grow and they're going to be very tiny. They're going to have a, 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 a really uh, big challenge to some degree to kind of get going. So we want to make sure we give them the best result and the best, uh, best start as possible. But they will need water, especially the seedlings. They will need water as they grow. What's going to happen with the lettuce plants is that, uh, if you remember, I sowed a lot of them. I don't even know how many I went, went in there Sprinkled because they're so along, tiny. Yep. Um, and they're going to start to grow and they're going to start to grow together. And I'm going to have to get in here and I'm going to have to decide to leave that one and then think about spacing and then leave another one, think about spacing. So the rest of those will have to come out. That's sometimes a hard thing to do as a gardener, especially a first, a young gardener, because uh, because you hate to take out a plant that's growing. But you, do, you don't want them fighting for it because they're yeah. not, neither one of them will turn out good. So you need to yeah, give it this yeah, chance. You need to give them some room to grow, basically. Um, and so that's that's certainly something to think about. And you'll you'll have that with all the different varieties of plants that you grow. Um, keep the water on there. Of course, we've created an incredible growing environment for these vegetables. That's exactly what we want these to have. Uh, what's going to happen is some other plants that we don't want in here are going to try and take advantage of that as well. So weeds, there's weeds, there's like all kinds of weed seeds that are probably already in here because that's the natural process. There's going to be some that blow in there, like you mentioned, the dandelions. So as you see things that are not vegetables, get them out of here because they're going to be using up that moisture. They're going to be using up that fertilizer that we put in there. So we really want to get them out of there. You, and you could probably Google if you're if you've never grown this these lettuce before you add in here. I think it's the red ones. Yeah. And you see things that start to sprout up. You could probably Google what do this ABC plant look like absolutely. when it comes up. So yeah. you're not thinking it's weeds and pulling out your baby yeah. lettuce. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, generally, if we have a nice straight row, then if all the similar plants are in a row, then we know that it's you know nature doesn't generally line up their weed seeds like that. So so we generally know that that's what we uh, uh, that's something that we've actually put there intentionally. Um, certainly in terms of, you mentioned Google, there's a lot of incredible um, local sources of information for gardening. Um, lots of Facebook sites, Instagram sites, um, and lots of great people out there doing amazing vegetable gardening. So, so look to those, lots of um, Newfoundland gardening specific sites. Because I think that, yes, you can Google anything and find you know, somebody who's grown you know, tomatoes that, that grow incredible. Um, not that we can, Ontario, yeah, be, yeah, yeah. So it, the local people reach out to them, and I'm sure yeah. as most Newfoundlanders, you reach out to them, and they'll be more than happy to help you. Absolutely. Um, the other thing too to consider is, of course, uh, is insect controls, and so we do have some challenges with some insects that want to get onto our vegetables, and of course, eat them too. Everything eats, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even the insects, and so uh, keep that in mind. Um, learn about those. If you're growing, for instance, cabbage, there's a there's a there's a butterfly called a cabbage white. And it looks for members of the cabbage family, and it'll just find them and lay eggs on them. Those eggs develop into these little green caterpillars that feed on those insects. So look to natural controls for controlling those, because you don't want to be spraying chemicals on there if you're going to be eating yep. this product. And sometimes it's just as simple as if you've only got a small number of cabbage plants, to go out there and physically take them off. Just in the evening time, go out and you know just sit down next to your plants and just look at the foliage and say, oh, there's one. I'll just take that off and get rid of it. Um, sometimes it's, it's as simple as that, and that's an okay. incredibly organic, really safe way of doing it. Quick question, do you talk to your plants? <laughs> I know they do it in flowers, but tell me the truth. <laughs> I don't talk to my okay. plants, but I sing a lot. And so, so the plants are just in general? Just in general, okay. and so Maybe I think, we'll, we'll I, I do believe in the, in the idea of talking to plants, because when you're talking, you're expelling carbon dioxide. Exactly, which and they, that's what they feed. Yeah, and that's what they feed on, so I think there, there's something in that. Um, I'll so be tonight singing to our plants in the house, and my kids will be just <laughs> crazy looking at what we do. But yeah, gotcha. So yeah, there you go. So there's lo there's lots to do in the garden. You know, my uh, my advice to uh, to the viewing public is is to do it. Just do it. Don't judge. Don't look to anybody else's vegetable garden. Just try it. Certainly look to other people for advice. Um, there's lots of great people around who just want to share it. I know personally, I love to talk about gardening. Well, I've been in this career for over 30 years, but I just love it. I love to tell people and empower people with the knowledge that they can do something like this. And, so, and, and oftentimes it's the most simplest thing, uh, but the results are just incredible. So Tim, we got the start, we got the middle, now the ending, the harvesting. As we s you said earlier, We've got some seeds, but we've got the plants that we planted will be done when we harvest. So any tips for people when it comes time to harvest? Uh, well, just um, my, my probably my biggest tip is to harvest it. I, I sometimes notice that people are so proud of it that they don't want to eat it. They actually don't want to dig it up and 
because then it's gone. You know, if you picture this, this nice bed of lettuce and then you have to go out and sort of hack one of those off at the soil level and bring it in and you're left with this spare spot. Sometimes there's that. So, uh, and it does happen. I, I, and so the one thing is to make sure that you do harvest it, make sure that you eat it, make sure that you make it a part of, um, you know, you celebrate that because you've done something incredible, I, I believe. Um, and so uh, harvest it when it's ready. Um, the, the one thing about a lot of vegetables is if you don't harvest it when it's when it's right there and ready, that the longer you leave it, it loses that f that freshness. It's probably still fresher than you're you're buying, you know, at a box store, or grocery store, or something. But um, you know, the lettuce loses its crunch, or maybe it gets a little bit bitter the longer you leave it. Um, the other thing is that uh, we all will make. I don't know if I'd call it a mistake, but we we, we all um, grow more than we can eat. And it's just the nature of it. You know, how much lettuce do we really need? Yep. You know, and, and what happens with, with vegetable gardens is that you're waiting for that first harvest, and you're waiting for that first harvest, and then all of a sudden it's ready, and it's all ready, but you can't eat it fast enough. So share it. You know, hand it around. Give it Families, to your neighbors. Food banks. Families, food banks. Families, Absolutely, yep. yeah. Uh, you know, make this uh, a, a really good, positive thing that you're doing for yourself and your family. Well, I, one thing that's great, we grew it last year, and my daughter just absolutely loved it. Every day we were out. Yeah. For the first few days, where's the plants? Where's the lettuce? Where's the peas? And then the cool thing was is that as, as it got you know farther along, she would go on, snap off the peas, open them up, and just yeah. start eating them as oh a snack yeah. instead of grabbing the you know a sugary yeah. cookie or whatnot. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Those those sugar peas, those sugar. It's actually called a sugar snap pea, which is an edible pod. It's absolutely delicious. I think that's what I had yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah, one of the local garden centers recommended yeah. this because yeah. I told them it was for seven six year old. This is what we're doing, and yeah. they said here's what you need, yeah. and he planned it out for me. We had you know your a sunflower in the middle, which we yeah. planted in the backyard that ended up taller than me. Yeah. Uh, snow peas and lettuce. Yeah. And it was yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, that's great. So there's so many I mean that you if you think about your experience there you grew three plants. Yep. And you've already told me how much that's given you already. You know? Uh, imagine imagine the feelings that, that people would will get and potentially get in their lives just by having a small box of vegetables like this. Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. I mean food security is a big thing. You know, we get a lot of our produce in, uh, brought in. We have local growers. Yeah. You know, and again, this isn't going to be enough for the whole year for you, but it yep. can save you money. Absolutely. You know, it's you know it's fresh. You know, you've grown it yourself, and there's some pride in it. So yeah, that's fantastic. Any other yeah. tips, Tim, before we wrap it up? No, just do it. Just keep doing it. Do just it. get out and get your hands on the soil. You'll be really super glad you did. Um, I don't know of anybody who's ever done this and been disappointed. It's just probably one of the best things you could ever do for ourselves. So get out in the fresh air. You know, it's free. Uh, it's there for the taking. Just just uh, seize the opportunity. Well, Tim, if there's one thing I've learned from here is that just do it. Ask questions, whether yep. it be online, Facebook group, social media, and the local garden center, and just give it a try. It's very rewarding. Absolutely. Well, Mike, that's that's it for this St. John Celebrate Summer and getting the, you know, your first initial vegetables in the garden. So my name is Jamie Korab. This is Tim Walsh, the nursery manager here at the beautiful Munda Tenure Garden, by the way. Very beautiful. Check it out if you haven't seen it. So thank you very much. That's it. Have a great day.